This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we're talking with Elizabeth Nixon. That's spelled N-I-C-K-S-O-N. She's the author of the new book, Ecofascists, How Radical Conservationists Are Destroying Our Natural Heritage. It's published by Broadside Books and available from Amazon.com and your local bookseller. And Elizabeth, thank you for stopping by today. Oh, my pleasure, Ed, really. Elizabeth, according to the bio on your website, you've written for both Time and Life magazines, The Guardian, Vogue, Harper's, and numerous other publications that run at least one green-themed issue a year. You've interviewed Nelson Mandela. You helped secure the publication of his autobiography while he was still in prison. What made you veer off into a topic like ecofascism that interests us radical right-wing neocon death beast libertarian types? Well... I, um, running into this story, uh, as I did, turned me into one of you. Um, it, there, there's no other reason for it. I, I moved home. I was in uh, living in New York and London, and when my father started to die, I moved home, and I'd bought a small forest on an island near my parents' house. And I tried to sell it, and I couldn't, so I built a little cottage, and clear-cut an acre of the 30 acres or so that I had. And, and I wrote a piece for Harper's about how the island had created its official community plan. And when it was published, all hell broke loose. I had death threats, you will phone me all night. They wrote letters to the paper. They, I mean, it was just insane. And, you know, I, I was sort of a traditional reporter. You know, you just get the facts. You go out and you get the story and you report it as best you can. You don't take sides. And I thought, what the hell happened? This is just a, a funny um, fable uh, that that at most mocks environmentalism, but they wouldn't, they couldn't even take that. And then I started to ask questions. And uh, when I was a column, a columnist for the Globe and Post, every time I'd write about the the um, uh, any of the issues involved in, in in the environmental movement, I would just get this insane blowback. I mean, people hated me, and I got the most insane hate mail. And, and and the more I got, the more I asked questions. And then I had to subdivide my property, and I ran into this monster that they have created in rural areas all over the world but particularly in the most beautiful places in the world, which is one of where I live, is very beautiful. Um, but it's everywhere. It's uh, it's in California is just, I don't know, it's like a prison camp once you get outside the cities. I'm not, I'm actually not exaggerating. People ha- are just suffering almost unbearably in working country places. I describe myself as living in a boutique country place where sort of, um, bureaucrats and university professors retire, uh, and there isn't much logging or fishing or farming or ranching here anymore. But in the places where traditional rural op- occupations used to deliver solid, you know, working and middle class incomes to people, that's gone. And those people are struggling and they're miserable and they're poor and families are breaking up and they ha- they they have they've been forced out of the their really some of them have lived in these places for 150 years their families and and the land is dying because it's lost its proper traditional stewards Elizabeth perhaps we should start by defining our terms when Jonah Goldberg wrote liberal fascism in 2007 He spent a lot of time early in the book laying out the conceptual and the historical groundwork to justify such a potentially loaded phrase. What is ecofascism as defined in your book? Well, one of one of the ways that Jonah um, defines fascism is by government control of everything, and that's what's happened in in the country. I mean. uh, officials from the Bureau of Land Management go out and measure the length of grass in in fields, or they um, measure the speed of flow in creeks and the depth. I mean, it, it is it's 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 controlled by millimeters. And if you if you if you contravene any of these um, in in increasingly intricate rules, you're put out of business. 
So when somebody comes on your property with a rural, a rural ruler, or a meter, um, you're just you know you are you're in a prison camp. I mean it's a it's a de facto prison camp. You know, I remember back in the 1990s when Republicans first took control of Congress for the following decade, you heard the cries of, the Republicans want to poison our air and water from the left, as if the GOP had its own sort of Logan's Run biodome to retreat to. Everybody wants a clean environment. So when and where did conservationism end, and as you call it, eco-fascism begin? I think that what happened was that they stopped measuring or auditing what they had done because they knew that they were destroying people's lives. And so uh, in 1992, for instance, the Rockefeller-founded Environmental Grant Makers Association said at their annual, they, they, I think, aggregate about $3.2 billion a year in foundation funding for environmental NGOs. They admitted that the grassroots opposition to them was huge. And in fact, they were um, taking people out of the forests and getting cattle off the range. And they were radically affecting in a negative way um, rural life. And they just decided to roll right over it because there's so much money involved. I mean, you can make a fantastic living in the environmental business now. You can make so much money because there is so much money being spent prosecuting the agenda at every level of the culture. And I think that's, you know, that's what happened. And as Terry Anderson says, uh, rural people are dispersed. They're not well organized. They're um, undereducated by the standards of city people. They don't know how to manipulate media or even manage media very well. And... And they're far flung. I mean, some of these counties, you have to drive four hours to get to them. So, you know, they're just overmatched. Elizabeth, how does eco-fascism impact the logging industry? In 1993, when Clinton shut down the western forest because of the spotted owl, what happened? Well, you know, it's mostly national forests, and he had the power to do that. And almost immediately, 90% of the forest was shuttered. You couldn't go in there and log. In some of the communities I I, uh, visited, they used to log 100 million board feet a year. Now they do 1 million board feet a year. So immediately what happened was that good family wage jobs were lost, hundreds of them. And then there were direct and indirect job losses that piled on top of that. But what happened to the forest, because the forest logging logging companies would actually manage the forest while they were logging, um, and they would prune and they would, you know, they would they would manage them and take care of them and um, make sure there was no overgrowth, make sure there were no fire ladders growing up the trees. But they can't even go in and do that now. So what's happened is there are 500 trees growing where 60 to 80 healthy trees once grew, and they're spindly, they're weak, they're, they're malnourished, the roots are rotting, um, and they're dying. So. And the forests that aren't dying are so clogged with brush that the Forest Service believes that between 80 and 200 million acres of American forest could go up in sort of a once in a millennium fire because, and it would be a canopy fire. Everything would burn. Everything would burn. The dirt would burn. The wildlife would burn. No fish would ever come back to the creeks. It would just all die. So that's what they've created in the forests. In 2007, NBC, which is owned by General Electric, which makes its money selling light bulbs, actually advised viewers to turn off their lights during a Sunday night football game, and all of the lights in the studio were dimmed except for the Toyota sign, since Toyota was sponsoring the broadcast. A broadcast that took place from an NFL stadium with about 5 billion watts of clique lights illuminating it. Around 2010, American Express sponsored an ad promoting the destruction of dams. The person on camera actually said, I'm a dam buster, and he was damn proud of it. What is the relationship between corporations and eco-fascists? Well, we, we think that corporations are just, they just get shaken down. In fact, I have letters from 
um, the Rainforest Coalition in San Francisco sent to uh, a logging company owner up here, a small company, saying that if you don't get with the program and sign on to our our way that we want you to um, cut trees and mill them and so on, we will destroy your market. Um, and that's what they do. They they will demarket something like, for instance, farmed salmon has been almost completely demarketed. Nobody eats it. Everybody's afraid of it. It is it's nonsense. But they've managed to do that, and they did that with um, logging in the western forests and. I mean, the oil sands up here, which are an extraordinary resource for, for the continent and could make North America energy efficient within 10 years because it's such an extraordinary resource. They demarket, they call it tar sands, and all over the world people think that Alberta oil is evil. It's not. It's I've been up there. It's It's like... It's so clean. <laughs> They're so, I mean, to give them credit, the movement has forced all kinds of technological advances. But, I mean, it looks like a park up there. After they get finished with a tailings pond, it looks like an English meadow. So, but we don't think of it that way. We think of it as some sort of industrial wasteland. And that's what they do. If they don't like you, they go for you, and and corporations just sign on. They say, okay, you know, this is good PR. This question is sort of an extension of the last one. Arguably, you can't have fascism without corporatism. So what do you make of President Obama's efforts at creating so-called green energy projects via his personal style of crony corporatism, such as Solyndra, the Chevy Volt, and, of course, the deep ties between GE and the Obama administration? Well, I mean, that was just that nobody writes about the fact that um, that whoever these financiers were, they used that government money and the loan guarantees to make themselves rich. So the after the companies go belly up, it doesn't matter to them. They all walk away with, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars. Everyone gets rich and except for the taxpayer pays. I mean, green energy is I, my house. We heat our house with geothermal. It's a fantastic way to heat the house, and it, my house is twice as big as my old cottage, and it costs half as much to heat. But putting that geothermal plant in costs sixty thousand dollars, and the average homeowner is not going to do that. But it, when it becomes financially viable, it's a it's a fantastic thing. But pushing it, pushing the market like that. It only works out for the people who are, you know, getting the grants and the loan guarantees. California has recently announced that it will be implementing some form of cap and trade. <sighs> How is that going to impact the state's businesses and its already pretty deep unemployment rate? Well, it'll finish off what what's left of private industry there, won't it? I mean, I well, I did a lot of my research in in California, Northern California, and Southern Oregon has been just destroyed by this. And, um, uh, I mean, I, I just I can't see anything but disaster coming from it. I mean, if you talk to people in Northern California who live in the in foresters or ranchers or fishermen or miners or anybody, they're, they're in deep, deep trauma. And I, I um, did a big case study of a town and a county in Northern California California, the Northern Crescent City and Del Norte, which are around the um, Redwood Forests. And that, it, it started when they created Redwood National Park in around 1980. And before that, that town was a thriving working class town. I mean, people did well, poverty rate was 5%. Um, smart kids went to university. People could pay for their retirements. They could pay for dental care. They could pay for all of the ordinary necessities of life without being dependent. Now, 35% of the kids that live under the poverty line, men who used to make 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks an hour, beg for $6 an hour um, jobs. That's what that's will happen. There is absolutely no doubt about it. The people that will make... Um, money from it are the people who implement it, and everybody else, certainly anyone 
that's, you know, middle class or below, will they'll just get punished. And it'll be by increments, so nobody really will notice it. It's just with one the first year it'll be a ten percent drop and then by the by by the tenth year you know, it'll be done. For those of us who haven't drunk the green Kool-Aid, is there any hope for the future? And in any case, how do you see ecofascism playing itself out over the next 10 years or so? Well, in, in my book, um, and it was really the, the, the reason that I wrote it, was that there, was, there is a solution, and it's a solution that comes out of the first Continental Congress. And it's something that's in every regulation from every land, land use, from Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, Bureau of Land Management. They all have these clauses in all the regulations and laws, and it's called coordination. And it says, it states that a, a community or town or township or a, a county um, must sit at the table as equals with any federal or state law that comes into the um, town. Uh, and by 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 coordination, they mean reach consistency with the planning and the tradition and the culture of the and the economy of that county. And unless the town, the county commissioners sign on. Whatever the feds want to happen will not happen. And wherever um, coordination has been tried in the states, there is solution. And so you can have the Sierra Club sitting at the table with the ranchers and the Air Force who have interests in the area, and all of the everybody sits at the table, and they are forced to come to accommodation. And it works. The economy of whichever county, and you know, I, I visited them. It does work. It, it means people have to really sit down and participate, but it works. Well, I certainly hope you're right. This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we've been talking with Elizabeth Nixon, spelled N-I-C-K-S-O-N, the author of the new book Eco Fascists: How Radical Conservationists Are Destroying Our Natural Heritage. It's published by Broadside Books and available from Amazon.com and your local bookstore. And Elizabeth, thank you once again for stopping by today. It was a great pleasure again. I think you guys are fantastic. Well, thank you very much, and good luck with the new book. 